Good morning, everybody. This is a live emergency briefing as we have an increasing threat of tornadoes this evening. It looks like it's going to be right around the overnight hours. Those supercells could develop right about sunset. Looks like about 0Z, which now is 6 p.m. Central Time as we have gone back uh, to standard time away from daylight time. But there you can see the target area bottom left for that conditional tornado potential. I do think that that window is about 7 to 10 p.m. And that includes the Oklahoma City corridor, even though a majority of that strongest wind shear is located a little bit to the east of the I-35 corridor. And I do think that that wind shear could be a bit displaced from where those storms initially develop right near sunset. And then it's possible that those storms could charge in uh, to that low-level jet axis. And you can see the low-level jet axis here with the uh, storm relative helicity forecast. This is the 3-kilometer NAM, 6Z, 3-kilometer uh, NAM, and I am waiting patiently for that 12Z model guidance. But basically, those yellows, oranges, and reds there, uh, that's greater than about 200 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative helicity. And so that is supportive of a tornado threat. But only when you look at that variable, when you take a, a deeper dive into uh, some of this data, uh, you can see that it is uh, quite a conditional setup. Uh, look at the uh, storm relative helicity located mainly to the east of that moisture axis. The moisture axis streaming up near the I-44 corridor up to the I-35 corridor as well, encapsulated within that triangle. And you can see that the storm relative helicity, that stronger 0 to 1 kilometer shear, is located just a little bit east of that moisture axis. And this happens quite a bit. That's because you have a little bit of a low-level stable layer that decouples that low-level jet, increases that wind just above the ground, decreases that wind right near the surface, and that overall increases the low-level wind shear associated uh, uh, with that decoupling or the increase of the low-level jet. Uh, but you can see that that is just a little bit to the east of that moisture axis. The moisture axis coming in a little bit to the west of that low-level jet. Sometimes this happens when the system isn't perfectly timed or doesn't have that neutral trough axis upon ejection uh, from the southwestern U.S. And uh, timing is a, just a little bit off with this setup. And you can see the surface base cape axis as well displaced uh, just off uh, to the east or to the west uh, rather of that uh, stronger low level shear there's that surface base cape uh, but let's take a look at uh, some of the forecast soundings and that target area uh, is located where that maximum low level wind shear uh, exists basically where those storms are forecast to fire along that pacific front and off to the east so let's take a look uh, a little bit deeper at some of these forecast soundings uh, here across the target area and this is the three kilometer nam i think that the h triple r uh, surprisingly is a, a little bit uh, more bullish uh, with that tornado threat but here you can see this cape axis down here uh, maximized at about 1500 1200 uh, to 1500 there we also need to take a look at the satellite and the real-time observations uh, to see how this moisture is progressing but my quick uh, glance at the wrap model uh, definitely showed uh, some very decent uh, uh, moisture return happening and even the uh, threat of potentially some daytime uh, uh, thunderstorm initiation, maybe about 5, 6 p.m. Sunset's getting earlier and earlier, though, uh, regardless of the time change. And uh, here you can see uh, the morning uh, models. Actually, this is uh, the evening. This is at 0Z, and it does show this meso low uh, that develops down here across northwestern Texas, the main parent surface low lifting up off to the north uh, through northern Missouri. Uh, and then uh, ahead of this meso low a little bit, that's where you get that acceleration of that low-level jet. Uh, the 3-kilometer NAM does show a bit of a weakness in that low-level jet, uh, just a little bit to the west of that main axis. But ahead of the uh, Pacific front, you can see this axis here, about 30 to 40 knots, south-southwesterly low-level jet. That's going to be available uh, to those thunderstorms after they develop uh, out there. Uh, that low-level jet is definitely that uh, uh, figment. A little bit of an extension of that low-level jet, a filament of some stronger winds there. Uh, definitely are going to be available to those storms that are going to be developing along that front. But the main low-level jet axis is a little bit off to the east, and then you can see this weakness here, southern Oklahoma into north Texas. And I do think that those storms could be very close to that weakness in the low-level jet. Uh, oftentimes, you'll get this low-level jet pushing way off to the east of where the storms are going to initiate. Uh, you can look over at the surface and see where that initiating uh, Pacific front is located, uh, basically where those winds shift off to a northwest direction. And then you can see this little pipe in the middle here where you have some veered winds, kind of some south-southwesterly surface winds that are relatively weak. And then off to the front, ahead of that uh, dry line feature, that's where you get those south-southeasterly surface winds, and that's where the strongest low-level shear 
is located uh, basically south central Oklahoma into north Texas. Look at these backed winds underneath that low level jet. That's where the strongest wind shear is going to be located uh, starting at about zero Z. Uh, this is the three kilometer NAM down here on the pivotalweather.com uh, website. Uh, taking a uh, forecast sounding right in the middle of that. The low level thermodynamics here are definitely not as handled um, quite as favorably for severe weather here by the three kilometer NAM. Let me position this a little bit further off to the right so that you can see that capping inversion. And uh, this little inversion right here, and this is a big inversion actually, the red line is temperature. And you can see the temperature is 64 over 61, relatively cool. And then you have that warm layer just above the ground, uh, moisture advection happening there, just above that a low level jet. And uh, that capping inversion is going to be difficult for storms to break, according to the three kilometer NAM, even though you do have a lot of elevated instability up here. But the HRRR model is a lot more bullish uh, on the tornado potential, and that's because it has a more shallow stable layer uh, located uh, right near the. It also has this little meso low here across North Texas, uh, the main parent surface low uh, lifting north uh, across uh, northern Missouri as well. Uh, but this is the HRRR model. Uh, this is the new uh, HRRR model that's coming in. Uh, let's shift over to 12Z as that is uh, as that HRRR is coming in right now. The 12Z should be available to us. And it, it does have that meso low at 0Z right near the Red River now. And even an extension of that low up towards central Oklahoma. Out ahead of that is where you're going to have those backed winds and a bit of an accelerated low-level jet there. Uh, let's see if the... Uh, HRRR has that weakness in the low-level jet as well. These high-resolution models uh, definitely doesn't have it uh, as indicated by the three-kilometer NAM. It brings that low-level jet all the way back to the initiating boundary. But the three-kilometer NAM seems to have that cold front dry line structure better depicted, and it has a majority of that uh, uh, convective initiation happening along the dry line. Not along the dry line. Uh, remains quite capped uh, to the east uh, of that cold front. And uh, here you can see the convective initiation along that cold front to the north, basically Oklahoma City off to the north. And this is the environment that we're going to be watching this evening between about 7 and 11 p.m. Central Southern Oklahoma into North Texas. Uh, you can see that low-level jet axis here, uh, some low clouds streaming northward, northeastern Texas into southeastern Oklahoma. So that's how we're going to be watching uh, that environment right there uh, for that uh, convective initiation. And uh, let's step forward. two hours so we will go to 8 p.m central standard time and look what the HRRR does it initiates these storms uh, within that triangle that we're talking about as that front slides down to the southeast the dry line passes back to the west again bringing with it that low level jet axis and any of these storms that develop especially these Durant up toward the Ada area these are going to be pretty close to that low level jet axis the strongest low level wind shear out there so you definitely want to watch uh, those renegades Durant uh, up toward uh, Ada as well. These are going to be closest into the strongest low-level shear. These storms back uh, toward uh, Denton, back toward Gainesville area, due south of Oklahoma City, these are going to be developing along the parent uh, cold front. And uh, within this little triangle to the west of that low-level jet axis, there is a little bit of some veering of the surface winds that's indicated, especially by the three-kilometer NAM. It's really able to resolve that quite a bit. The HRRR, though, brings that dry line back to the Pacific front, and that's when it initiates those storms. After about 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, low-level jet begins to increase as well into those storms near the Red River, uh, but it also veers with time. So you got 35 to 40 knots. The timing with this system and the shape of this system isn't incredibly favorable for a really robust tornado potential, but it is quite conditional. Uh, the timing's a little bit off. Uh, you've kind of got this dry line a little bit out ahead of the Pacific front. Most of the models fire the storms along the Pacific front, and then they don't quite reach the wind shear. Also, a majority of the short-range models have a lot of low-level uh, stable air uh, where the core of that low-level jet is located, just a little bit of a displacement of that strongest low-level shear with that instability. But within this triangle, as that low-level jet increases uh, and that uh, dry line sloshes back a little bit to that Pacific front, you do have within this triangle uh, between the western edge of that main low-level jet axis and the Pacific front uh, where uh, conditions become increasingly favorable after about 7 to 8 p.m. And that threat goes all the way down to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And when we look at a forecast sounding on the HRRR, 
Notice how that capping inversion near the low level low, low levels is a lot uh, more uh, shallow. Uh, that uh, uh, capping inversion isn't as stout as the three kilometer NAM is indicating. You've got a warmer surface temperature here, even at seven or 8 p.m., 66 over 60. Uh, you've got a more stout elevated mix layer as well. And that's why you've got tornado potential with that very favorable looped photograph right over my head. I bring that down a little bit just below my head and you can see that looping photograph. The surface wind near calm, quite decoupled uh, just below that shallow inversion there. And then your one kilometer wind increases all the way up to 40 knots. And look at that curvature up to the mid levels of the uh, uh, troposphere, five, six kilometer winds almost due west. So you have a lot of directional shear between the surface southeasterly and weaker. Your one kilometer wind pushing up near 40 knots, very strong south southwesterly and then you have that westerly and still strong mid and upper tropospheric winds more than capable of evacuating that rain and hail in the updraft and you could definitely see a lot of that directional shear uh, within the sounding forecast sounding so look at that uh, wind profile surface wind you've got a weak southeasterly surface wind then just above the ground you get that southerly and south southwesterly low level jet increasing above 40 knots and then do westerly mid-level winds. So one thing that's very favorable with this setup that we haven't seen with these previous setups is you have a lot of directional shear between the surface and the mid-levels. We definitely saw that directional shear increase with that Dixie Alley event, southeastern Texas into southern Louisiana, where we had that big tornado that crossed Interstate 10 near the Beaumont area. And you have a lot of this dry air, too, in the mid-levels of the atmosphere that the HRRR seems to be sampling a lot more or representing a lot uh, more strongly than the three kilometer NAM, and that leads to these very steep mid level lapse rates. Uh, likely a lot of hail, uh, too, with any of those renegades that are able to form. And especially with this directional shear, there's such strong directional shear that I do think uh, that the hail potential uh, within uh, that area uh, is quite substantial with that elevated mixed layer, a lot of cold air in the mid levels. And then at about 3Z, uh, this is at about 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. You start to get a pinching off of that instability, but you still get these storms back building down the front into North Texas. Uh, still a, a, an environment that is supportive of that tornado potential. Storm Prediction Center has increased that tornado potential to 5%. And right now you can start to see this uh, uh, shallow inversion starting to thicken a little bit and those surface winds starting to veer, but you still have a very large looping photograph, even down near the Dallas-Fort Worth area by about 7 to 10 p.m. And uh, the HRRR does fire storms all the way down to the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. And one thing we've seen this fall season is this hot spot from central Oklahoma down into North Texas for severe weather. And I think that we're going to see that again. It's possible down here into Denton, Gainesville. These could be tornado producers by about 10 p.m. Still able to dynamically pipe uh, through that shallow stable layer at the surface. Whenever you get a strong low-level mesocyclone or a tornado cyclone, it's just like a drill going through a piece of wood. It's able to drill down vertically through that uh, shallow stable layer, a little bit of cold layer right near the surface as you lose daytime heating, and you get an acceleration of that low-level jet just above the ground, continues to accelerate uh, that low-level mesocyclone. It forms a little pressure perturbation below it, and that causes it to propagate downward through that drilling through that shallow stable layer. We've seen dynamic piping on display throughout this fall season. It often happens during the fall season when you have these earlier sunsets and you lose that surface heating and you develop a little bit of a shallow stable layer right near the surface of the earth. I think that's what we could see again. And uh, let's pick a forecast sounding right near the inflow region of that storm uh, down near uh, Dallas and Denton area. And you can see a lot of uh, stable layer that's starting to thicken there by about uh, 9 p.m. Uh, let me slide this just a little bit off to the right so you can see the low-level thermodynamics depicted by uh, the HRRR. So you can start to see this area of a relatively a statically stable uh, layer here increasing right near the ground, 66 over 62, even though you're bumping up those dew points a little bit. Strong wind shear, a lot of directional shear in the low levels here. But what this uh, tornado threat depends on is how shallow will this low-level stable layer be? The HRRR shows it to be easily breakable, relatively shallow there, no problem to develop that tornado potential down near the Red River. But the three-kilometer NAM is not as bullish with that low-level 
stable layer. And I do think that the uh, HRR, though, probably has a better handle on the uh, low-level uh, thermodynamics here uh, during the late fall in the southern plains. And I do think that we're going to realize a tornado potential down here, basically from Denton up through uh, Durant, uh, up toward McAllister in this area across southeastern Oklahoma here. I think it's going to be a uh, nocturnal event. Storms are going to develop along the Pacific front, probably right near sunset and maybe a little bit before sunset. Uh, but that wind shear isn't going to slosh back to the initiating boundary until after sunset, about 7, 8, 9 p.m. That's when that low-level jet axis is going to slosh back to that initiating boundary. But definitely a cluster of supercells here. Uh, and you're also embedded within a very strong low-level jet. A lot of directional shear within this environment, too. And uh, let's take a look at the shape of the upper level trough. The shape of the upper trough is really what drives all of this. Uh, whether the shape of the low level wind shear is going to be conducive. And there, there you can see this is a, a relatively unfavorable setup to get a big outbreak. Uh, but usually if you get May thermodynamics, uh, if you had a little bit earlier in the fall, some better thermodynamics. And I think that this would be a more robust uh, tornado potential. It does have a slight negative tilt. It is transitioning from a neutral to a negative tilt upon ejection. And you can see this little jet streak rounding the base, southwestern quadrant of that trough. Definitely is going to be responsible for helping to have those surface pressure falls in the southern mode, central Oklahoma down into north Texas. Uh, but the main parent surface, though, here lifting up toward northern Missouri and the main Vortmax way up into, uh, into Canada. So this is a massive consolidated jet stream. And I think because of that cold PDO, the cold water in the Pacific uh, Tecadal Oscillation in the north uh, eastern Pacific here, I think we're going to have the tendency for a western U.S. trough to form through this second fall season, through the end of the fall season. And this is definitely a sign of things to come for the spring of 2022 for an active severe weather season with this con consolidated jet across the central U.S. But that slight negative tilt Still leads to a robust but relatively veered low-level jet here, but a ton of directional shear. That's uh, the one-kilometer wind. And uh, then you can see that the uh, storms will initiate near the base of this trough, so you're getting these more westerly winds down here uh, near the Red River. Uh, that's going to enhance that directional shear. And it does look like there could be blizzard conditions that develop over the central Canadian prairies. Could include uh, the Winnipeg area here as a big surface low is going to evolve and then lift northward. And uh, I think that the uh, tendency uh, for this uh, subtropical high to hang on in the southeastern U.S. is going to cause these troughs to mature over the plains and then rocket northward up toward uh, the upper Great Lakes. And that's going to happen again instead of barreling in uh, to the Mid-South and causing a Dixie Alley severe weather threat uh, with a breakdown of that subtropical ridge. But looking at the long range, I do think that there is a, a pretty active pattern that is uh, being suggested. Uh, when you look at the long range models here, uh, you can definitely see uh, that the uh, tendency for that western U.S. trough is definitely real. Look at this. Becoming occluded uh, like a roping out tornado there over the upper Great Lakes, a big bowling ball of an upper level system. And you might think that we're going to have a return to this normal ridge trough pattern that we often see during the winter. But because of that cold water in the northeastern Pacific, you're going to see that tendency for a western U.S. trough play out again. So here by the mid part of November, you have that classic ridge trough pattern, cold temperatures across the eastern U.S. And then as we get toward about November 20th, we start to get more toward a zonal flow pattern. And it could bring about a pattern change toward the end of November, right around Thanksgiving, where we could get more of a trough ridge pattern. And there you can see it playing out by about November 20. And I think that this will probably be more of a consolidated trough dominating the Western US, just realizing that those uh, short-term climate indicators are favoring the formation of a western U.S. trough. I try to hedge my model analysis based on that short-range climate, realizing that there is the desire uh, for the climate system to form a western U.S. trough, uh, which is favorable for severe weather, pumping that moisture northward out of the Gulf of Mexico. 
And let's see really what uh, the snowfall totals are, just for fun. Realizing, though, that the GFS is notorious for showing these monster snowstorms when they don't always happen. But this is where the snowfall is going to be maximized. It looks like Winnipeg could easily see a foot of snow a little bit less uh, over those areas. The tornado alley of Manitoba, like Pipestone. Uh, Sean could get several inches of snow from this up in the Melville, Saskatchewan area where Dominator 3 is located. Uh, that dense forest land there of uh, southeastern Ontario uh, definitely going to get hammered uh, by snow as well up there. Maybe some blizzard conditions on the north side of that vertically stacked system. And then as the cold air moves across the Great Lakes, some indications of uh, some early season lake effect here off of Lake Michigan, some westerly flow lake effect. A classic a vertically stacked cold upper level low driving those cold westerlies across Lake Michigan. Good setup for Grand Rapids to get quite a bit of uh, lake effect snow and also some early season higher elevation snow there off the end of Lake Erie, maybe Buffalo, especially uh, to the south of Buffalo where you have some of that higher terrain over the Chautauqua Ridge. Some indications are that there could be quite a bit of snow there as well. And classic La Nina, lots of atmospheric river action hammering the coastal ranges there of Canada uh, with big time snow as well. Probably going to be a big snow season up there. Coastal ranges of Canada down through the Pacific Northwest. I do expect that heavier snow to extend down into the Sierra Nevadas as well as we get into the core of the winter. Maybe some big big blizzards as well uh, to intercept uh, near the Mammoth Mountain area. Could easily happen. So that's a breakdown of some of those models. There's a slight risk uh, here. Uh, by, uh, as being indicated by the uh, Storm Prediction Center. And they did add that 5% outlook. Let's take a look now at see what some of the latest wrap is showing with that moisture return. One thing I'm noticing with the wrap, and there it has that apparent surface low down, down over the eastern Texas panhandle, start to see moisture return underway here from the wrap model. And this is just a quick glance to see out near 20Z. And look at that, uh, rapid destabilization that's going to be happening by 20Z. Uh, indications are, uh, with these trends in the rapid, there certainly could be daytime initiation along that Pacific front as it slides to the southeast. Definitely daytime initiation of some potentially elevated storms, northern Oklahoma up into southern Kansas. But look at that blob of uh, reduced convective inhibition, northwestern Texas and into central and southern Oklahoma, kind of giving you an indication where the most favorable low-level thermodynamics are going to be located. And I am back doing these regular live briefings. Thank you, Facebook supporters, for making these live briefings possible, live storm chasing as well. I've been planning on returning to live Q&As as well exclusively for Facebook supporters, storm chase EDU as well. I'd like to get that going through the winter. I've recharged my battery, so I'm going to begin doing uh, these uh, regular live briefings, including a radar breakdown tonight as these storms initiate uh, right near sunset, 6, 7 p.m., maybe a little bit earlier across northern Oklahoma. So by 20Z, though, definitely the presence of surface-based uh, instability uh, showing you where those storms could initiate uh, there near the Red River region, Frederick, uh, up toward Lawton. Uh, the nose of that instability is uh, poking up toward uh, central Oklahoma as well. But the HRRR uh, definitely showing that low-level stable air to be a little bit more shallow. Uh, you also can see a late development of that wind shear as that low-level jet axis, the western gradient of it, is going to slosh west toward that uh, Pacific front that sags down through central Oklahoma into north Texas eventually. So right now, uh, definitely showing rapid moisture return underway. Let's take a look at the surface up as well across the southern plains. And you've already got 60 dew points here streaming northward. 60 is fine. Uh, 60 to 62 type of a dew point will be more than sufficient uh, to generate uh, that low-level uh, instability and to make that uh, low-level uh, nocturnal inversion to be shallow enough for those mesocyclones to drill through it like a dynamic pipe. Uh, but you can see that the surface map is showing rapid moisture return across Oklahoma. Dew points very near 60, upper 50s into the low 60s already. So we really don't need 
uh, further moisture advection, but it is going to continue with that low level jet. Uh, this isn't late arrival of that moisture or anything, but it is a timing issue uh, with the front arriving right near sunset, maybe a seasonal timing issue a little bit across the Southern Plains. Uh, but a lot of times these events go big down here, Southern Oklahoma into North Texas. A lot of times the tornado uh, potential will be a little bit more favorable uh, than the models are showing. Uh, over recent years, we've been in the DFW area chasing these nocturnal tornadoes many times from Halloween, even through the Christmas area back in 2015, December 26, you had that outbreak of strong tornadoes here across the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I'm not going to say that's going to happen, but anytime you get a 40 plus not low level jet with 250 to 300 zero to one kilometer storm relative felicity, the potential is there. Uh, for damaging a tornado and anytime you get a tornado touching down the potential is there uh, for it to be destructive and even violent especially with that low level jet cranking just above the ground so that's why i do think the threat is conditional not all forecast models are showing it uh, even the short range models the three kilometer nam showing a thicker stable layer there across southern oklahoma to north texas which would suggest very minimal if any tornado potential but the h triple r is showing um uh, that uh, uh, nocturnal inversion to be much more shallow near the ground and more easily uh, to be overcome by a low-level mesocyclone or a tornado cyclone that's capable of drilling through that shallow stable layer, just like a drill going through a piece of wood, except in this case, uh, it's a fluid. And a fluid's a different densities, of different uh, vorticity. Um, a, a fluid that's rotating is associated with uh, pressure perturbations uh, below and above uh, that vortex. And that pressure, ba pressure perturbation below causes the wind field uh, to propagate downward. Uh, that's the concept of dynamic piping. And as that pressure fall uh, gets closer and closer to the ground, it excites cyclonic spin around it. Uh, and eventually it reaches the ground. And then you get the formation of a tornado uh, and those complex dynamics near the ground, the corner flow region out there as well, uh, basically where that wind is going right toward uh, the vortex and then rocketing straight up uh, at a 90 degree angle, uh, certainly. Uh, so here you can see the, the target area, central Oklahoma into North Texas, uh, basically near the western gradient of that low level jet. The three kilometer NAM doesn't look as uh, favorable for tornadoes, but the HRRR looks quite favorable, uh, definitely. One thing I do notice though with the HRRR is with these nocturnal setups, it can be a little bit bullish uh, with that low level instability. Uh, or the uh, uh, just how shallow uh, that stable layer is right near the surface. And then uh, when you have mixing issues, it overdoes mixing. So it's kind of uh, an error on either side there that balances it out a bit. Uh, but you might think that the HRRR is a little bit better tuned for these events. It seems to be better at predicting uh, these conditional nocturnal tornado events across the Southern Plains, Oklahoma into North Texas. So that's why I'm leaning a little bit toward the HRRR. And I do think that that tornado potential is robust. And here is the three kilometer NAM SRH. And the HRRR actually brings that Western gradient all the way back to that initiating boundary uh, during the evening hours. So I do think that there is a threat of tornadoes uh, this evening. Stay tuned to those watches and warnings. Oklahomans know what to do. And I'm gonna be going live uh, this evening doing radar breakdowns as uh, these storms initiate uh, pretty close to sunset. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in to my live weather report. I am going to be doing these more regularly as well, and uh, I look forward to that. I'm also uh, planning on heading up to the Indiana Storm Chasing Convention this weekend, uh, where I speak on our rocket launches on Saturday. I think at 3.30 is, uh, is when I speak up there at the Indiana Storm Chaser Convention, so I'm excited about that. I'm going to share our research, which we're submitting for publication this fall. Uh, the paper is written. It's about 38 pages long. And then now I just have to go through uh, the submission process and then the peer review process as well for that paper. Uh, but I wish I could have churned it out earlier, but we got a lot of burgers on the grill. And so you have to make sure each burger uh, gets cooked. You don't want to lose any burgers or cause them to be overcooked or even worse, start a fire. So thank you everybody for tuning in here to this morning weather briefing. Stay tuned to those watches and warnings. Conditional tornado potential here, possible central Oklahoma into North Texas. Never stop chasing.